It's your ability to jump, hop, shuffle. Um, anything that you do on skis, you have to do with the platform. So if we look at the two pictures in on the presentation, um, the little guy on the left has got an awesome platform. You can see the distance between the tips of his skis, his feet and his knees are exactly the same. Uh, same for the girl in the middle. The distance between the tips of our skis, our feet and our knees are exactly the same. The only difference is we've got a balloon in between our legs on the middle photograph or on the right hand photograph. And the little guy on the left is holding a pole um, across the way. So once you've got the platform, we spoke about rolling our ankles. So it's a really, really simple movement. You can do it standing up. All you do is literally just roll onto your big toe, just roll your ankles. Once you've done that, um, is when you keep your knee going in a little bit more. So um, I don't know if anyone can see my screen or not. So we've rolled our ankles in. We've rolled and out the knee just keeps going. Okay, it's a fairly simple movement to just roll your ankles. And once you keep your knees, keep going into your knees, your shins should look like window wipers. So that, that was a big, uh, the big point of week two last week was uh, trying to keep your shins like window wipers. Um, we want to see the parallel shins. When it comes to upper body, we're actually going to look a little bit more at upper body tonight. Um, upper body is anything from the waist up. Um, we want to try and keep our shoulders square. So that means keeping our shoulders facing down the hill. Um, and also keeping our shoulders uh, level. So if we were to look at our shoulders going to cross the way, um, we want to keep them level. So from a tactical point of view, we looked at the line. And I know that guys that have been coached by uh, Hope, myself, and Tom are probably fed up of us saying, when you pass the gate, you need to be aiming above the next gate, okay? Every single time. If you do that, you guys are going to start winning races. You, you can't go wrong. So line is so important. It's 80% of why people win races. Um, last week, we spoke about course inspection what to look for, look for rhythms in the course, look for maybe combinations, if it's slalom, if there's any rollers, any jumps, anything. Um, so we looked at a couple of techniques to do with that. So there was a couple of questions to follow up on. Um, and these were really good questions. So the first one is what visualization methods work well for children, so for athletes? Um, and it's a, an amazing, amazing question. I had to think about it for a bit. So a couple of things that we do is if you ski a course, you get to the bottom and your coach says to you, I want you to close your eyes and go through the course again, but do it in real time. So you ski a GS course, it takes 57 seconds. You close your eyes and you go, okay, three, two, one. Okay, I'm pushing out the start. Okay, now I'm on course. Now I'm going. You want to try and get as close to that 50 sec uh, 57 seconds or however long it is um, and just visualize yourself. The other way to do it is really simply um snow plow down next to the course if it's an inspection really almost like a fast snow plow over exaggerate what you're doing um, it's another really good way to do it should athletes inspect courses in training absolutely um okay it's not always possible with especially if you're in a mountain um if there's you know a long turnaround on a chairlift or a poma um, or t-bar it's not always possible but it is such a good habit to get into um similarly if you're training slalom, normally it's just a little button lift or a poma, um, or if you're on dry slopes, you should be looking at the course on the way up and thinking, oh, you know, that gate there, I can maybe come, maybe go a little bit straighter, or maybe I should need, to, I really need to work on my line on that little gate there. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's stuff about inspecting courses. Course inspection, now, this is mainly for, for coaches and, and parents. You've got your stage inspection, your full inspection, your distance inspection. So your full inspection, is what 90% of under 10s, 12s, 14s, and 16s will do. Um, your full inspection is when a coach goes with you from the start gate right the way through to the finish. Um, and then they slide the whole way down. A staged inspection is what we see mainly with FIS teams or World Cup teams, Robo Cup teams. It's where athletes will start themselves and there'll be coaches at key points in the course. So um, say, for example, we're looking at GS. There might be four points on the course where it's really tricky or the terrain rolls over 
Um, coaches will position themselves there and athletes will just slide down to them. Coaches will say, so what do you think so far? Good. Okay, I think this. I think this. I think this. Okay, at this section, you need to do this. Similarly, you've got a distant course inspection. Uh, pretty rare these days. Um, it's where coaches won't speak to athletes in inspection, only at the bottom. Um, again, mainly aimed at those, those older guys um, that, that don't want to be bothered. And you get to the bottom and say, right, talk me through it. What do you think? Okay, you know, so it's um, nah, pretty straight at the top. Then I've got that hairpin. After the hairpin, I've got to really set up for that steep section. Once I get down the steep section, I know I've got that banana gate and then I can just go for it. I can just pull the string and go. Um, so again, it all comes with experience, like I said last week. Um, but for the majority of you guys, full inspections, um, coaches will meet you at the top, take you all the way through to the bottom. The most important thing about course inspection is to ask questions. Um, ask questions about the line. Ask about, should you be in the tuck? Should you be standing up? Um, all that kind of stuff. Is there a difference between a training course and a race course? Good question. So, I mean, the answer is no. Um, it, it's the same combinations. Um, the only difference is a, a race course has certain requirements. So it has to have between two and four hairpins, uh, one or two verticales, and between one and three banana gates, so, or delay gates. Um, whereas a training course, if you're, say you want to work on rolling your ankles. You might just set a corridor of gates, so the same rhythm the whole way down, um, just to work on that one element. But, but realistically, no, there, there's, not a massive, um, there's not a massive difference. So moving on, this is one of the under 10s, and the platform that, that this little guy has is awesome. So you can see immediately that there's a difference between what his legs are doing and what his upper body are doing. So by putting his hands on his hips, he cuts off his upper body completely. He can't rotate, can't bend forward, can't do anything. So this is one of the tens, and we are going to relate this to this. Um, this is River Radimus, guy who was skiing in the World Cup this morning, uh, or the World Champs this morning, American guy, 1998, I think he is. Um, so the top left picture, this one here, if you can see my cursor, um, he's finishing his turn. This photograph here, you can almost see he's coming to the end of the turn. He's got that platform ready to go. The bottom left picture, you see the distance between the tips of his skis, his feet, can't see his knees, for uh, argument's sake, we'll say they're the same distance. Um, and this next point, this top one up here, um, is, is the money. So yes, his hips are a little bit low. We're actually going to come onto the hip next. But just ignore that for now. We're going to look at his skis, his feet, and imagine where his knees would be. So he's got that platform to be able to do this in the next picture. Now, that movement there, there is a difference. Just have a really, really good look at the top right picture and the one below it. That There is a slight difference between the two of them. In the middle one, um, he's been able to roll his ankle. So that's the very, very beginner. I managed to freeze that just as he's thinking about rolling on, rolling his ankle. So that's going to be the start of his turn. Um, just like this guy, he's rolled his ankles. River here is, I'm going to make this one a bit bigger so you can see it. There. So that's how World Cup guys start the turns. Now, if we've got the 10s and the 12s and the 14s, 16s, 18s, 21s on here, if World Cup guys are doing it, that's exactly what we want to be doing. Um, just roll in your ankles and look at the distance between the tips of his skis, his feet, and his knees. Um, if Again, from last week, if there's one thing you take away, tips of your skis, your feet, and your knees, it just gives you that platform to just roll on a, an absolutely arc a turn. So we've got the knees in, we've rolled our ankles, the knees are going in. What happens with the hips? Um, now this is, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So I'm just going to give everyone... Um, sort of 30 to 40 seconds um, to just have a read of that slide um, and then we'll, we'll speak about it in a second. So just have, take 35, 40 seconds, have a read of it and then we'll talk about it in a sec.
Okay, okay. So we're going to have a look at this picture here. So um, everyone knows what a pencil looks like or a ruler. If you were to have a pencil or ruler and draw it from this person's boots to his knees to his hips, if you were to keep that line going like a pencil or a ruler, he would fall over because all of his weight would come down in here. Okay, so where my cursor is, that's where all of his weight's gonna come down. Now, I want you to look at the next slide. Tell me what you think, or just have a 10 seconds to think about this photograph. Just really, really quickly, what do you think? Okay. So this is one of the Italian girls. She, you can notice right away the distance, now that this photograph firstly is unbelievable. The distance between the tips of her skis, her feet and her knees, exactly the same. However, what is just unbelievable, it's phenomenal in this uh, picture, is if you notice her legs are going out, but her upper body and her shoulders are almost exactly, are almost identically facing up the hill. So if your legs are out like that, her shoulders, just like we spoke about last week, are completely square on down the hill, um, which is, for all you guys that want to ski slalom on the World Cup, um, this is exactly what we want to be doing. Okay, so she's rolled on. Oh, she, well, we hope she has. She's rolled on. Her knees have gone in. Her hips have gone in. But her upper body has stayed exactly upright the whole time. Now, <laughs> that's a very difficult thing to do, but it's exactly what we should all be aiming for. Um, so how can we improve this? And this is more for older athletes. You can start off, it's called a funnel drill. So imagine, I'm sure everyone knows what a funnel looks like. You start off quite narrow, and we're just going to get wider and wider and wider and wider. Okay, maybe a reverse funnel. So to start with, you're going to do four turns. All you're going to do is roll your ankles and, and your turns are maybe going to be one meter offset across the hill. Then all of a sudden you're going to go to two meters. Okay. And your knees will have to go in. And then all of a sudden you're going to go to three or four meters. And by that point, you've got absolutely no option, but to roll your knees in and your hips will follow. So that's an awesome drill um, for any coaches on here, even for parents, um, you know, propose it to coaches. Say, oh, um, what about the funnel drill? And it's, it's such a simple thing to do, but you get so much out of it. Um, so that, that's all the writing is on that slide. I'll do the same as last week. I'll send the slides out um, I, afterwards. So same photograph as last week. I think that's amazing. So we've got Dave on the left and Dave on the right. Um, on the left shows you what you can do with your knees and your ankles. It is that, That's exactly what we should all be aiming for. Okay, we roll on. On the right, he's doing exactly the same thing, just, I don't know, maybe 20 years later. So the, the, the question has to be asked, and this is where we, we maybe get a little bit tricky. If you have your platform and you're standing completely straight, so like Amelia is there, okay, on this photograph, you're standing completely straight like that. What happens if she was to just put her hip in straight away? So just move our hips across without rolling our knees and ankles. Um, and we need to thank one of the American girls for giving us the demo on the World Cup, uh, World Champs yesterday. Um, this is Paula Maltzen. She, You can see in this top left corner, her skis are off the ground. Now, airtime is slow time. If your skis are off the ground, um, you definitely don't have a platform to stand on. Now, because of her skis were off the ground, what she's done is had to speed up the whole process of rolling your ankles, putting your knees in, and your hips. So instead of rolling her ankles and putting her knees in, she's just thrown her hips over as fast as possible. As a result of that, as we can see in the third picture, so the, the bottom left one, the cursor's on just now, if you were to draw a line from her head down to the snow, it's probably at least a meter inside where her skis are. Um, now, in, in lay terms, that is not fast. Um, why is it not fast? Because in order to be fast, we need to uh, have pressure 
on the skis, more pressure on the outside ski, so it bends and you can get that reaction at the end of the turn. So what she's done is kind of, instead of going step one, roll your ankles, step two, roll your knees, step three, move your hip into the turn. She's gone, I don't want to do step one. I've not got time to do step two. I'm going to go straight to step three. Goes to step three and all of a sudden uh, this happens. Um, now, uh, I'm sure e even parents that don't know an awful lot about skiing, um, you will be able to identify that is not the, uh, not the fastest of positions. Um, so that's all because she ran out of time. Now, as a result of running out of time, she's gone in on the inside ski, lost more or less everything. She lost the race. I think she was a second out after a 20-second run or something. So back to this picture. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard the word separation. Now, what separation? What is it? Separating your feet? Is it separating your knees? Is it in terms of ski racing, separation is your ability to control your legs separately to your upper body. So that, that's what this girl does. Unbelievable. This is, this is an example. Um, what, what she's done is she's got that ability to separate so our upper body is completely upright um if she if you draw a line from her head down it's probably going to come through the gate whereas if you drew a line through paula's head on the way down probably there it's at least a meter maybe even a meter and a half inside her skis um so this is quite technical. This is probably for the older guys, but even still, we can make it fairly simple. Your upper body, we want to limit off. We want to keep it square. We want to keep it fairly upright whilst your legs go underneath. So I don't know if you can see my camera or not. Um, imagine this is your upper body, my left hand, this one. Your legs are going to go out and your upper body is just going to stay still. Your legs are going to come underneath. On occasion... Your upper body is going to have to follow, but your legs are going to go under and your upper body is just going to follow. It's just a case of having a really strong core. That's why we do a lot of core exercises on the, on the keep fit, on the, uh, on the Zoom fitness classes. Um, it, it's a really, really important factor. So um, that this is, it's all comes down to what, what we mentioned before. It's all about having pressure on the outside ski. Um, it, it keeps your center of mass over your skis within within reason. So like we said, if you drew a line from the inside of or inside of her head, right the way down, it, it, it doesn't kind of distribute her weight on the inside ski. So she's evenly balanced over that outside ski. Um, just, just quickly, what do you mean the outside ski? If it was this picture, it's gonna be this one here. It's the one furthest away from the gate is, is your outside ski. So we've got the pencil, uh, maybe put that reference in a bit late actually. How, can we, what can we do to improve your separation? Now that we can't get on skis or the majority of us can't get on skis, there's a video, this is uh, Roberta Malesi, she's a Italian, I think GS skier. This is an awesome drill. Now it takes three people. Um, her, her feet, if you look at the middle picture, um, that, that's her and her platform. Her feet are a good distance apart, knees are a good distance apart, and her upper body is completely upright. If you look at her feet in this left-hand picture, they're exactly the same size. Exact same size? Yeah, of course they're the same size. They're exactly the same distance apart, okay? So that's exactly what we're looking for. That she's able to roll her ankles, roll her knee, put her hip in. Even though she's not moving forward, she can still bounce off that ball and come back up to standing in the middle. It's the same in this picture here, um, the one on the right-hand side, her feet remain the same distance apart. Now, what we can see is she's going to have a pinch in her hip just here because she's trying to keep that upper body as upright as possible. So her legs are doing all the work, but she's keeping her upper body as upright as possible. It's, if, you, if you've if you got enough people at home and you've got two Swiss balls, you know, give it a shot, send us your videos. If they don't work, we'll, we'll put them on you've been framed, but it's an awesome uh, drill for everyone. So... Just another example, um, one of the Swiss guys, again, the reason he's allowed to do it is because of the platform. He's got a good distance between the tips of your skis 
his feet and his knees. Well, I, I'm probably boring everybody. So this is what happens. I'll, I'll give you an example. This is me, um, 2000 and uh, I can tell you, 14, maybe 15, um, GS race. Now, I've come into here top left. As you can see, my shoulders are leaning in the way. So they're leaning towards the gate. Now, that means all my weight is going through the inside ski. This picture here in the middle, you can see my shoulders are still leaning in the way. So they're still leaning towards the gate. We want them to be leaning away from the gate, if not level, okay? So third picture, I think we all know where this is going. Um, and as a result, purely because, A, I was running a little bit too straight, but secondly, my shoulders were so far inclined in the way, I just fell inside. Um, and that happens. I think if you went to guys on the World Cup, so if we asked, I don't know, Charlie Guest, Tilly, Dave, Raposo, Laurie, uh, Billy, how many times have you fallen inside? It's got fallen inside. Uh, the answer, probably 5,000 times each, maybe. It, it is such a common thing to do, and it is so difficult um, if you get into a habit of it. So just, if it does happen, strip it back to the basics, roll your ankles, roll your knees, and keep that upper body upright and make sure your shoulders are level. So that, that's all the technical stuff um, for tonight. We're going to do a fair bit about tactical stuff. So I, I'm just going to summarize very briefly. We're rolling our ankles. We're rolling the knees. Once you've rolled your knees, your hips move across only on snow and dry slope. Your hips basically stay above your feet the whole time. On snow, your hips go across. As the hips move across, your shoulders, you want to try and push the outside shoulder down. So you're going to feel a pinch. Um, let's try and see. You're going to feel a pinch like that. And you're going to feel it right in at your hip because that's how you put your pressure or hold your pressure over your outside ski. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, what we're, that's where we're at just now. Um, keeping the shoulders square and level is a, a massive, massive point. And that's in all forms of the sport. Stubbies, slalom, GS, super G, and downhill. Um, so that, that's all the technical stuff we're, we're going to look at tonight. We are now going to look at the tactical stuff, um, which is uh, it's how you intend, it's, it's what you want it to be. So I guarantee you, everyone here that stood in the start gate has gone to training and thought, oh, yeah, you're this is really good. I'm really fast. Stood in the start gate of a race and thought, oh, my goodness, what on earth am I doing? Okay, so I'm going to go left. I'm going to go right. Okay, I'm going to push. And then you get to the finish and you go, oh, what, what on earth just happened? What happened there? I can't remember anything. I, every single person has done it. Even the guys in the World Cup do it. So what, what is different? on a race day to a training day. This is just as important for coaches, parents, athletes, staff, um, team staff, physios, techs, whoever's on the hill. So what, what, what do you do differently? Do you prep your skis differently? Do you inspect the course differently? Do you race in your cat suit, your speed suit? Do you go to the cafe on a race day? How many warm-up runs do you do? Do you shadow the course when you're free skiing? Do you even think about the course when you're free skiing? Race skis, training skis, are they, are they different skis? Are they prepped differently? Do you tuck more in a race or do you, what, what's different? So these are all really good questions. Um, and to answer it, it's just one question uh, and everything is why. why. Why would you prep your skis differently? Why do you inspect the course differently? Why would you race? And it's, uh, and, and it's the same in all sports. If you trying to think tennis, you don't train with one racket that's got strings on, I don't know, some tension, and then all of a sudden for a match, you're going to go to a different racket. Same with golf. You don't practice with some golf clubs and then go to other ones. Football, you don't change your boots for a match or, or you don't change the ball, um, how blown up the ball is for a match. Same with rugby. Um, all sports, gymnastics, um, everything. You want to control what you can. So everything that's listed 
on this slide, you can control. Um, you can prep your skis. You, you can do everything. So it's it's really interesting um, how people prepare for races and how they prepare for training. So this is something I think is massively, massively important. And, and um, I hope, hope he's going to talk for a bit um, in a minute about just different perspectives on what people do on race days and all that kind of stuff. So train as you race. I was speaking to Ruslan, who is the former BSA Fizz coach. Um, he's now one of the coaches in the World Cup with Albert Popov, um, Bulgarian slam skier, top 20 in the world now. Um, and he said, what they try and do is train exactly like the race. So whether that's training with a bib on, um, as you can see in the picture, Laurie Taylor here has got a sponsor, uh, has got one of his, bib, his sponsor's bibs on. Um, it's something we do. We hand out bibs to athletes um, for training days, especially time training runs, all that kind of stuff. Um, so just to go back to this, should you prep your skis differently for a race? Definitely not. Um, you, you want to be skiing on what you're used to. Um, the, the only thing you could prep differently is your wax. Um, if you're going to put a race wax on instead of a training wax, but again, noticeable difference from an athlete point of view, you won't notice it. Um, from a time point of view, yes, maybe. Um, inspect the course, like I said before, if you've got an opportunity to inspect the course in training, you should absolutely do it. Definitely do it. Race in full suit. Um, how many times, and I used to be a, a massive, uh, I was awful for this. You train in your salpets or you train in shorts and your soft shells and your jackets, then in a race, you race full suit, full speed suit. So there's a, a start, I'm, I'm going to come on to it in a minute. It's something about if you wear a suit or a speed suit, you can go up to nine and a half percent faster. It doesn't sound like a lot, but once you add all that up, it is absolutely massive. So if the weather allows, get out and train in you in full suit, you know, train in your cat suit, your speed suits, um, and just get used to being in it. Feel comfortable in your surroundings and, and what you're wearing. Um, how many warm up runs do you do? This is a good one. If you're training, um, and you're maybe doing timed runs at a training session, nine times out of 10, your fastest run is going to come at the end. It's going to be near the back. So if you're racing, why would you inspect then maybe just do one run, maybe just sit in a cafe and then go straight up the left and, and race. Now, sometimes, at the, especially on dry slope, um, it doesn't allow for it. But on snow, you want to be getting as many runs in as you can. Once you've done your inspection, just keep getting the laps in, keep getting the laps in, think about the course, maybe do sections of the course. You think, oh, okay, so there's one bit that's really turny. So I'm going to do 10 turns just now that I think are the same turniness. Um, or the same radius as the race. Race skis, training skis, this is a bit of a grey area. Um, some teams have training skis, race skis. Most teams nowadays will number their skis. Now, you can see this is uh, Schifrin skis in the picture. Um, we'll number them. Why do you number them? Because all your skis should be the same. Um, you, if your race skis are in a lot better condition than your training skis, you're going to get a surprise on race day. Similarly, if you train on a pair of skis for 100 days and you race on them, say you do seven races, you've probably skied on those skis at least 100 times more than, um, than the other ones. So they're going to be a lot stiffer, the race skis. Um, it, it makes a little uh, quite well, it makes a fair difference. Um, so, for example, what me and my brother used to do, we were fortunate enough to get skis from Fisher um, and we labeled them one to eight and it was a case of whoever was fastest in training got first pick of the skis for the races. So say we're at downhill race or we're at GS race, whoever was fastest in training the day before would pick the skis that they wanted to race on for the race, um, which was fine until they started beating me and then it wasn't fine. So um, th there's loads of different things. Looking at skis, if you've got one pair of slam, one pair of GS, absolutely fine. If you're going to get another pair of skis, uh, make it another pair of slalom skis. Um, because slalom skis, edges are 99% of, um, of what's important in a slalom ski. Uh, finally, in a race, would you tuck more? Um, 
uh, and why? Do you tuck in training? Do you look for speed in training? Um, or is that a case of you get to the race and you think, I'm really going to push this out? Um, so, yeah, a couple of things to think about. Um, we're now going to hand over to Hopi. Hope's uh, one of the BSA coaches. She was in the national team for a bit. And she's just going to talk to us about basically what her race day routine was um, and maybe even what her start routine was. Um, so, Hopi, I think if you are able to do that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, so hi guys, thanks Fraser. Um, so Fraser's already mentioned it, train as you race. This is probably one of my favourite sayings um, because it allows you to get into a routine and a habit that suits you and you feel comfortable. So for me, uh, my race day routine, I had to be super, super organised. Everything was packed, I knew where my skis were. So when I woke up in the morning of my race day, everything just went as smoothly as it possibly could without any hiccups. Um, this allowed me to stay calm and really just flow into the day. Um, when it came to getting on the hill and starting up my sort of routine, I did a few runs where I did slow drills. This allowed me to get into a rhythm of things and allowed me to gain that good, strong platform, as Fraser always talks about. Um, this you know, makes you completely comfortable on your skis. You get used to your skis again. And then obviously you run through your inspection. Um, inspection is completely different for everyone. Obviously you have the different, you have the stage, you have the full, you have the distance. But for me personally, I always like to sort of do, do it in my own time, take my time. And if I had any questions, I'd always refer to the coach. And as Fraser said, it's always really important to ask questions um, and that's what I did and that that just allowed me to really gain a better understanding of my skiing and of the course um, obviously in children's you either get your bib at the bottom I always made sure I had that and I always put it on straight away um, so I didn't lose it yeah because that seems to happen quite a lot at races these days um, I always used to have a little bit of time where, you know, I chatted with my friends and stuff. But when I knew my time was coming up in the start gate, coming to the time of my start preparation was giving that time for me to really warm up. And that was a lot of dynamic movement, lunges, squats, did some core exercises to really, you know, activate the core. Um, before maybe try obviously you've got to get in your skis pretty quick when it comes up to your number but I always tried before maybe two three numbers before me to really pump up my heart rate this allowed me to just feel warm and comfortable in my um, just everything really um, and that just allowed the blood to pump around my body knowing that all my muscles were ready to go that was a really really important aspect for me um, it's really good though um, to know that it, it's important that every single one of you athletes, all of us, myself, Fraser, Tom, we all have different routines and that's so important because it's important to know that what works for you is gonna benefit you. And it doesn't matter what other people are doing, what other people are thinking, you've gotta do what's right for you. And that's a really, really important thing. Um, so yeah, that just gives you a wee bit of an outline of what a routine may look like. Um, yeah. Amazing. No, no that's, uh, that's absolutely perfect. Cheers, Hopi. So, um, I mean, Hope absolutely nailed it on the head there. Everyone is different and I, I think it's really important. So Hope um, would do it one way. I would do it another way. Tom would do it another way. And the next person would do it a different way. So um, I used to... I, know, I used to really enjoy training. You know, we'd have a laugh. Um, and how many times in training do you just go? You, you, don't, you don't think to yourself, oh, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm gonna do this. You just go. So some people, like myself, where, you, you know, I'll, I'll be in the gate in three, four races time. I'm still talking to the guys around me. We're still chatting away about, I don't know, what's for dinner or, or something like that. But then as soon as that 30 second warning goes um, or you're one to go, like Hobie said, it's just a case of you in the hill um, uh, and it's, yeah, just go time. Once you get to a race, 
you should be feeling confident enough to ski full gas, 100%. Um, one thing that I think is really important, it's just come to me. If you ever watch boxing um, or, or most contact sports, these guys come out the, the changing rooms uh, towards the ring and they're sweating already. They, they've been working for 40, 45 minutes before, at least. Um, you know, getting the heart rate up, getting a sweat on. So when it comes to the, you know, the boxing fight, they're, they're ready to go. They, they know what's happening. They're, they're loose. They can move. It's exactly the same in skiing. Um, you know, there's, there's guys doing press-ups. There's guys running uphill. Um, so find out what works for you. You know, at, at training, take a couple of runs where you keep yourself to yourself. And you think, right, I'm going to. And if it works, that's your race routine. Have a couple of runs where, you know, you're laughing and joking and you're like, okay, oh, yeah, no, what's for dinner tonight? Oh, okay, yeah, oh, it's my favourite, go, you're off. Um, just play around with it. Um, it it's all comes down to kind of what you think, what works for you. And it, everyone's different. And at coaches, it's up to you guys and us to find out what works for each athlete. Um, I, I remember I was at a downhill race um, in Mijev and there was about 15, 20 bibs before me and the coach is just screaming at me. He, he's, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do that. And it was awful. I just turned around and I was like, you, okay, you need to go away right now. And there was other guys who would love that. So it all comes down to coaches figuring out athletes and you know what works for them and all that kind of stuff. So um, one point that we did speak about was the tuck. Now, you have to excuse my slippers in this. Um, the, the tuck is a massive advantage, but it can also be a massive disadvantage. Um, now, obviously, I've, I'm in a tuck here, just a straight tuck. Um, the aim of the tuck, or, or what, what should the tuck look like? Front on, um, imagine you're skiing through a wall. Okay, there used to be a program called, oh, come on, I think it was called the hole, where you had to fit into shapes that went through. That's what that's all the tuck is. You want to get through that wall as small as you can. Um, so, does rolling your ankles apply in a tuck? Absolutely. So we can see here, um, this is one of the under 14 girls. I, I think this picture is awesome. So what we can see is she's got the same distance between the tips of her skis, her feet and her knees, and her upper body is doing something separate. Her upper body, shoulders are a little bit up, but her upper body is doing something separate to what her legs are doing. That, that, that's, you know, that, that's awesome, awesome stuff. Um, to be able to do that in a tuck is, is amazing. Um, and it's a difficult thing to do. So when do you go into the tuck uh, and, and how do you know? The first thing is, uh, and rule number one of being in a tuck is you don't sacrifice your skis to be in the tuck. Now that, that sounds a bit weird, but what you don't want to be doing is to be in the tuck, but your skis are skidding. What you're much better off doing is standing a little bit taller, but keeping your skis going. So rolling your ankles um, and maybe even a high tuck. So tomorrow's um, fitness session that's going to be released, there's tuck pulses. So hopefully everyone can maybe see or maybe not. Um, so my tuck is probably there. If I want to roll my ankles, I'm probably going to come up a little bit higher so I can roll my ankles, okay? Because if I'm here, it's really, really difficult to roll your ankles, okay? So what we don't want to do is sacrifice your ability to roll your ankles just to get in a tuck. Um, rolling your ankles is still more important than, than being in a tuck. So in a straight line, this was a test, uh, I think it was the Austrians did. Um, I think it was a seven, uh, seven percent, seven degree hill, 400 meters long, and there was someone that stood completely upright and there was someone that stood in a tuck. Now, 400 meters is about double the length of the indoors. Um, the indoor slopes are your Brayhead, uh, Castleford, Hemel, all those ones. Um, one second faster a tuck compared to someone standing up. One second, that is massive, massive difference. Um, so, yeah, tuck's really important, and it's something you can work on um, without having your skis on. So look at the picture. If we're to look at this picture here, nothing sticks out. There's no elbows sticking out. There's no knees sticking out. The shoulders are not sticking out. If you look at this picture on the left, the same thing. Um, 
it's like, I don't know if anyone still plays Mario Kart, right? But if you go really fast in Mario Kart, you get this blue thing. It's like a blue shield that goes around you and you go flying past everyone. If your tuck's that good, that is, that's what it's going to feel like. Um, that, that's what we're aiming for. So this is a, an example um, of... Uh, so, so and again, the videos might not work. If not, I've got a screenshot. Um, just take a look at the difference. So here, so this person's gone into the tuck here. Look how the position they're in between this red gate that's coming up and the next blue gate, okay? So that's it there, that's all it is, okay? Oh, that was my fault. Um, so, that position there. Now, to do that on skis is really, really difficult, okay? It's that picture there. Um, yeah, apologies for the screenshot. So, that's what we're looking for. Your skis are flat, bases are faster than your edges, and you're really squeezing your elbows in, keep your shoulders down to get through that hole in the wall. Okay, imagine you're going through the hole in the wall. So I promise you we won't be long, probably two or three minutes left. Everyone's different. Find out what suits you. So we've already identified that Hope trains differently to me, that trains differently to Tom, that trains differently to my brother, that trains differently to the guy who's got the bib behind me. Um, and experiment. How many warm-up runs do you need to ski really fast? You know, we don't want to ski fast. We want to ski really fast. How long do you need it to start? Are you a person who can clip the skis on and just go straight through the wand? Or do you need to have your skis on for 10 people, eight people, six people? Do a couple of jumps, all that kind of, and have you got a warm up routine? If you haven't, get in touch with us. Get in touch with us, we can help you out. It might be two minutes of on ski warm up. It might be four and a half minutes of something you can do at the top of a race hill before you put your skis on. Um, so yeah. Get in touch with us if that's something that you haven't done before um, and you want some guidance on it. So tips and tricks. Now, a training diary is amazing. So this is my, this is my training diary um, from 2014. Um, so I'll, I'll put send the slides out as well, but you can see it's just little snippets. So... Um, We'll go this one, March 25, GS training, skiing on the race piece, six and a half runs, skiing well, technically, very smart, top two different courses, um, feeling good for the GS, that was the next day, went to the opening ceremony, had a bit of recovery time, and we were ready to go. Now, if I was looking back at that, the night before a race, and I said, okay, March 25, I was training, uh, where was I? I was training Sierra Nevada, okay. Um, right, oh, I was feeling good. Oh, I remember that day, actually, and I was making these turns, and what was I saying to myself? What was I saying to myself? And so what I did sometimes was you, you put little buzzwords at the bottom. So it might be line or it might be um, something completely unrelated to skiing, but it just reminds you of that day. Um, so yeah, training diaries are amazing. It doesn't have to be something that's, you know, it doesn't have to be a novel, just a couple of lines after every training session or we, we wrote them uh, every day, um, every night, just before you go to your bed. Rate each day out of 10. Um, why was it good? Why was it not good? What did you do? Um, so, yeah. Disciplines, feelings, gates, ski, weather, anything you want to put in it. What did you have for your dinner? Um, whatever you want to put in it, put in it. So, training and environment. Experience, all comes with experience, sorry. Same with the race runs. Line and training is another thing you can experiment with. Now, what's a good day? What's a bad day? Well, there's no such thing. Um, so Hope and I, I think Tom as well, actually, um, used to be coached by this Scottish guy, Ronnie Naismith. Um, he's coached more or less all the guys in the World Cup. He, he's a, a bit of a guru um, when, it, when it comes to coaching. Now, he said a good day, volume-wise, was 500 slalom gates or 300 GS gates. So your average slalom course is 50 runs, 10 runs a day if you're up in the mountain. Sounds easy. Until you've got your, you know, 11 minute chair lift, you've got six warm up runs at the beginning, you've got a cafe break for a reset, um, and all that, all that kind of stuff. So they're just rough ideas. Um, and again, uh, this is the the last slide before I won't keep anyone too long. 
Um, it all comes with experience. Hope he said it, I've said it. Um, once you get in the start gate and you only know the feeling of standing in a start gate if you're in the start gate. Parents, if you've never stood in a start gate on a race day, go up to the top and whether it's on a dry slope, an indoor or up on the mountain and stand in the start area and just get a picture of what it looks like. Even if you're not allowed in the start gate, stand next to it. Try and just get a picture of what it's like to be standing ready to just give it gas out the start gate and it will really change your perspective of what you think a race is like um on a race day do what suits you especially older guys don't you know just because someone else is doing something doesn't mean you have to do it um the fizz guys that are on here it used to be you could only race 25 races a year now there's unlimited so you i mean technically i think there's races 320 days, uh, days of the year um <laughs> if you really wanted to i'm sure you could so for older guys, especially, and younger guys, races are not the end of the world. Um, there's always going to be that next opportunity um, to race. Now, yeah, there's not a lot of racing going on just now, but just imagine how good it's going to feel when you stand in the start gate next time, knowing all this information that when you go to that next training session, you can say, okay, I'm going to roll my ankles. Oh, whoa, that was okay. I'm going to roll my knees this time. All right, so you know what? I'm going to do the funnel drill. Then you stand in the start gate and you go, whoa, that was, that was awesome. That, that, was, that was really something. It's all about building your experience. You've got to want to stand in the start gate. If you stand in the start gate and think, oh, I don't know if I really want to do this, you're never going to really push it. Whereas if you stand there and you think, oh, this is mine, I'm, I'm going to shoot here, I'm going to go. Just go. It, it, that's what it's all about. And, you know, we're, we're not going to win every run. We're not going to win every race. But if you're going out with the attitude to win every one, win every run, to win every race, and to improve every single session, training session that is, you guys are, uh, are way on the right step. Um, you're, you're making a step. And it's just a case of just going up the ladder, going up the ladder. Um, but yeah, when it comes to race day, do what suits you and just push from A to B as hard as you can. Um, so, yeah, what we'll do is the same as previous weeks. Um, that's all for tonight. If anyone's got any questions, um, just email me again, fraser at britskiacad.org.uk. Um, and we'll run next week. Next week will maybe be the last one um, for the technical presentations. We might look at doing some other stuff. Um, so, yeah, apart from that, uh, this recording will go on YouTube. Um, it's on the BSA YouTube channel. Um, I think everyone's been emailed out the link. If you've not, get in touch with me and I'll, I'll email you the link. I'll share the link with the, the BSA YouTube channel. Um, we've got more fitness sessions coming out Tuesdays, Thursdays, live fitness session on Sundays. Um, that Everyone's welcome to join. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, hopefully, everyone's learned something. Um, and uh, we'll see you Sunday or see you next week. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Fraser. Thank you. Thanks, Fraser. Thanks, Fraser. Thank you, Fraser. Bye. 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 Bye.